Folks, welcome inside the Parisi Palace, high above 3773's Broadway. This is the Jake Feinberg Show. Company on Power Talk, please go to our website, powertalk.live, and download our free app to your smartphone so you can stream all of our live local programming, including Solomon on Blast, the Jim Parisi Show, and yours truly, the Jake Feinberg Show. Can't thank you enough for making us part of your day today, and what a high honor it is to bring in an absolute titan of the metaphysical, someone who has been attempting to expand consciousness from her earliest days uh, when her uh, she, when she was intrigued by the mysticism of the Middle Eastern cultures and the spirituality of those um, religions, and uh, it led her to... Um, uh, to today, where she uh, runs the Beckley Foundation and tries to uh, create evidence-based and scientific-based research uh, on the uh, on the positive qualities of um, of microdosing uh, as it relates to and its health correlation to uh, depression and anxiety and addiction. Um, and uh, it's been a long time coming, but um, it's it's here now. Amanda Fielding, welcome mm-hmm. to the Jake Feinberg Show. Well, thank you very, very much. It's been uh, lovely to meet you after these long two years wait. The, I mean, just uh, it's you. it's just it's 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 cathartic, and I believe this is just the beginning of our uh, collaboration. Um, you know, I I wanted to ask you by starting. Um, did you um, have an opportunity to um, spend time with uh, the Sufis? Um, when I was, whatever, 16 or 17, I traveled to Egypt, spent quite a lot of time in Egypt, and then I spent time with some Sufis, and also in Syria, but not not a serious amount of time, really. Um, so I, I, I loved the Sufis from when I studied them, as, um, you know, I was studying comparative religion and mysticism at Oxford, and I particularly love the Sufis. Can you? So, um, I mean, because here's the thing: we we hear now. I mean, in Western uh, media, uh, we hear it in. You know, it's just. I mean, so much of the uh, we don't hear about the Sufi Sufism at all. No, and it is a dancing, no, no. spiritual, magical, and and so I, you know, I I I know that you're you were. Your godfather was a Buddhist monk, so yes. and that was your sort of beginning, your ascendancy towards this. Uh, I mean, just such a glorified and beautiful uh, trip towards enlightenment. Um, but yes. I wanted you to talk, even though you might not have had a lot of exposure. What was it like in Egypt, or could you just talk about a story of of when you did interact with the Sufis? Um. Well. I was living in, in, when I was there, I was either living in a place called El Gurma, the city of the dead, and, um, or in um, Cairo. And I used to sometimes go to Sufi gatherings in Cairo, I remember. So I think they hit a very high point in uh, a mystical thinking and expression. And it's strange how they slightly dropped out of the um, kind of light at the moment popular light but i'm sure there are a lot of people still following them there are um did when you went there first of all where did when you what was the thing about your godfather that you loved the most that you really got off on the most well well funny enough 
I, I actually never met him. <laughs> um, I was always, <laughs> I was always going off to the Middle East when I was kind of 16, 17, 18, with no money and usually with no passport, um, to reach him. But uh, I always got held up somewhere on the way in Syria or um, Jordan or Egypt. Somehow I never got there and then he died. So I, I was told he died in a, um, a cramped state. But you know, I don't know if that's an exaggeration. But um, so that was very sad that I never met him. But he very much left a lasting impression on and gave me a passion for mysticism which is really at the core of every every religion. Explain to the and, explain um, ex, ex, explain to the audience um, your idea. I could not ask a better person about mysticism, and when and and ultimately when when you when you begin to access it or experience mm-hmm. it, how it becomes part of your soul. Is there was there a defining? You never met yeah. your godfather. But I'd like you to talk about yeah. an early experience of real mysticism uh, yes. and, and what your definition of it is. Yeah. Um, well, I had it uh, quite often as a child. I think many children have a mystical experience. Yes. Um, and I grew up in an incredibly beautiful place, but totally isolated. And so uh, there was nothing to do except kind of mooch around <laughs> and dream. And, um, and then there were parts of the garden where I had a mystical experience quite regularly. I had this kind of fantasy of a god figure living in that part. And then um, my mother was Catholic, so I went to Catholic church in, in my childhood. And I remember having mystical experiences in church. You know, suddenly the, the prayer book would come to life and tears would trickled down Jesus's face in um, a very sweet way. And then later, I had a mystical experience. I remember quite a strong one when I was about 15, 16, at a place called Mistra in Greece, um, where, where there are uh, monks, monks lived there, and Byzantine times, I think it was. And I just remember going off into a completely other world listening to goat spells and i know nowadays in the wheaty tribe when people take um is it a boga they're told to follow follow the bells of the sheep because if they lose the the sound of them they'll die really I, I know that feeling that you need to keep your your mind focused on on the sound to bring you back to daily reality kind of thing but um, I mean, they were wonderful, Rumi, and and uh, there were, uh, you know, a whole lot of those poets who I absolutely loved. So I spent much of my kind of from whatever, six to 18, studying and reading the mystics and mooching around and having, uh, you know, mystical experiences. <laughs> and then I wanted to... Um, um, study mysticism, mysticism, and I was very lucky in there was the kind of leading um, um, academic in the field, was someone called Professor Zena, who hung out at All Souls in Oxford. And for some reason, he took me under his wing. Wow. So I used to go to tutorials with him twice a week. That was when I was about 16. What was his name? Can you say his and name again? Um, Professor Zena, Z E A. I'm a bad speller. H N E R, something like that. So he was was was, was he Rosa. was he Indian? Was he Indian or where? What what, what ethnicity was he? Uh, P- Professor Zena. Um, well, he he was fairly English. He was incredibly sharp. <laughs> I love this. What I basically kept, and then sadly he was I think burned to death years later. Um, with with his cats in all souls, um, but um, he was a, a Catholic convert, so he actually disapproved. He wrote a wonderful book called Mysticism, Sacred and Profane, um, I suppose in the early 60s, and um, he actually thought that achieving uh, mystical 
debate through the use of psychedelic drugs was profane. Um, but when a year or two later, I, I tried psychedelic, uh, tried LSD, and uh, you know, had a mystical type experience, I, I don't th- didn't think it was at all profane, and I thought it brought firmly to reality what I'd been reading about in the mystics. And so I gave up reading about it and took up taking LSD instead. Okay, now and, this is uh, really, imp- this is so important. So I want you to, first of all, enlighten me and my audience. Who were the mystics between the ages of, I don't know, you said six to 18, roughly, you were reading. Who were some of them? And then when you had, um, when you had your psychedelic experience, can you, can you co-join their messages and what you felt viscerally on your trip? Um, yes, I mean, it's the experience of being unified with nature or with the universe or uh, losing the boundaries of the self and um, kind of dissolving into the greater unity. And, um, I mean, I, I loved uh, Sufis, you know, who have been like Kabir and Rumi and um, all of that lot. And also, obviously, the Indians, um, the Buddha and other Indian I, I think they had such a wonderful way of describing that reality because they were so familiar with it. And to a lesser degree, I, I read some Christian mystics, but um, uh, I, I think the Eastern ones were more familiar with the territory in a way. I mean, St. Teresa of Avila, her descriptions of her experience, it could be an, a description of an LSD um, experience. Um, very, very similar. And um, when I later set up um, the Becky Foundation, which is a charity to research um, states of consciousness and their altered states, particularly in using um, psychoactive substances, and not only, um, I, it was amazing what we found in, in, um, with brain imaging. You see uh, the uh, reduction of the default mode network, as they um, now call what we used to call the ego. The ego. I like um, the ego anyway better. I like the ego a lot better. Yeah. But um, you know these neuroscientists; they have to have. All right, no, I know. I understand. I understand. Yeah, and but um, what wh- what is interesting is that what I remember experiencing in the sixties from taking um, LSD is very kind of clearly <coughs> described in um, the research we did um, as part of the Beckley Imperial Research Program. Um, looking with brain imaging at what is happening in the brain um, when you get a kind of peak experience. And basically, um, the, the kind of repressive network in the brain, which is called the default mode network, um, and which senses what reaches consciousness and what is repressed, um, has its blood supply diminished during a psychedelic experience. So the in, inhibitory and, and, and repressive function is lifted, and then the whole brain begins to communicate with itself. So um, the segregation of the different um, networks and, uh, and, and parts of the brain um, is broken down. So all the different parts start communicating with each other. It's rather like when the mind... Uh, when the cat is away, the mice will play. Mm-hmm. And, and it, it was just beautiful how the whole brain was lit up with connectivity as opposed to little parts of the brain being lit up. And I think that that is typical of the mystical experience, that the kind of daily controlling network of um, kind of tunnel vision and doing what is ordinarily done drops away and the brain becomes more like entropic, more chaotic, more like an infant's brain. 
where um, many more perceptions come in simultaneously and um, and um, consciousness is fed from many different areas of the brain, whether it's emotion or visual or auditory. And so it kind of increases synesthesia and also uh, I would say probably the likelihood is that it increases um, telepathy in those um, those uh, sensations which are normally kept repressed. Let me ask you, this is, we're talking to Amanda Fielding here, who's uh, just honestly one of the headiest intellectual people, and, and what's cool about it is she is so avant-garde in her approach. Um, the synesthesia, did you start to experience that on your, on your first, on your, when you started taking acid? Um, somewhat, but not, not, I wouldn't say it was a major experience. If mm-hmm. you know what I mean, but mm-hmm. I know exactly um, what what the experience is. It's crossing crossing Im- impulses. Right, from, right. It's uh, amazing. I mean, you know. everything everything gets blended together. I mean, it's uh, yeah. You know, you you, you exactly. start to uh, taste. You start to taste smells, or you know what I mean. Just things like that. All the exactly. sense. Yeah. So I mean, yeah. was it? To, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. No. Um, no, I think it's very fascinating. And, I mean, I'm um, a great advocate of the potential benefits of the use of psychedelics. And um, my personal favorite was always LSD because it's so clean. Clean, clean and... Um, well, it, well, listen, you know, let's be very clear. At, at one time, it was very clean. But then it changed over... Yes. To, you know, once it got out... Once it uh, became underground it, it changed um, no but it's back to being very clean again <laughs> okay uh, that's cool. i haven't taken it in a while i don't i wouldn't know but okay. go ahead go ahead yeah yeah i mean i'm doing research with some um, lsd which is 99.9 percent um pure well that's wonderful so that's, when i was at boston yeah, university yeah. I, I cannot i i know i was ingesting sugar cubes that were mixed with speed and it just wasn't pure, but I'm glad that no, from the right. research side yes. that, it, that you're, you're, that's beautiful. That's very pure. Well, funny enough, this is, yeah, exactly. I mean, but it's not always the case at all. Right. And actually, um, prohibition has been a, t- a total disaster for research and have really, um, squashed it for the last 50 years making it virtually impossible. And it's just a few kind of foolhardy um, uh, kind of die-in-the-hard warriors like myself who've kept at it. And now finally we've broken through certain um, boundaries and um, have shown, hopefully, that actually it's an incredible compound that can be immensely valuable in the treatment of psychological disorders like um, addiction or depression or post-traumatic stress disorder or, you know, a, a, a great many of those. And I also think it could be very valuable in much smaller doses for conditions of um, maybe maybe even in microdose, it could be very valuable in Alzheimer's and other sorts of things. This is fantastic. I mean, I really want you to explain... Yes. From a scientific point of view, with post-traumatic stress disorder, I mean, I can understand marijuana to a degree for a cancer patient, yeah. allowing them an appetite, or uh, yeah. as opposed to big pharmaceuticals giving you uh, value, you know, opioids. How marijuana can be helpful for post-traumatic stress disorder, but can you explain how microdosing can help post-traumatic stress disorder? Um, sorry about. Uh, I was saying that. Um, so far, there's almost no research on LSD. Um, I did um, one of the first researches using brain imaging technology. Uh, I suppose it was published a couple of years ago. And uh, it had very remarkable and um, uh, uh, results showing how connectivity increased when the default mode network um, 
decreases activity. And connectivity is a kind of enriching of the sensation. So you've got much more um, of the brain um, enriching the moment, whether it's coming from senses or memories or um, um, emotions. Um, and that one could see. That the wonderful thing about brain imaging is that one can correlate the subjective experience with what is happening in the brain. And that's very exciting. But what I'm fearing with the microdosing study is that the, um, is that the stimulation the, um, will be so low with the microdose, maybe the um, brain imaging technology won't be able to pick it up. I see. So uh, I, I've yet to find out. And actually, one would love and where, 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 where the change is little, one needs very big numbers. But the horror of modern um, research is that they have such de high demands. You know, every person taking a microdose has to have a doctor on call and two sitters or something, which becomes vastly expensive. So, I see. Um, I mean, would you, know, you, would you, would you, would, would you, this is so, in, exactly, so, I mean, like, should they, would, in your, I, in your ideal, in the, in the Beckley Foundation model, if you were, Mike, if you were giving a microdose to somebody who was suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, you would prefer them to have an experience the way you would, or the way I did, where you would just kind of go on your own trip and be in nature and allow yourself to, to, um, how would, um, or, or would well, there, would there yeah. be, I mean, because you're talking about like a, like resources in order to make sure that they don't have a quote unquote bad trip. So yeah. they have, you know, so what would, what would be your uh, formula? Um, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm come from a background of um, self medication, if you like. I, I read the whole of Freud and Nietzsche and um, a lot of other writers, William Reich on LSD and psychoanalyzed myself. But, you know, that was back in the, in the 60s when... Um, yeah, you were way you up. Know, out, you were out. Way out. I was, I was out then. Oh, you're now, still out, though. I mean, I can tell you're still hey, out, though. You're still so sharp, though. I mean, it's not like... Anyway, so go ahead. You, you, you continue. But now, within the Beckley Foundation, you know, to get... Uh, I mean, psychedelics are treated like nuclear weapons their control <laughs> and uh, they cost a vast amount to buy because they have to be um, um, GMP which um, is a ghastly kind of regulatory control and um, the whole thing becomes medicalized but what it, wh why I think it's valuable is that I think only with the very best sums can one demonstrate the benefits of psychedelics and I think the very best sounds is the way to overcome the taboo, which I think is the most terrible mistake in society. But nevertheless, it's happened and got really kind of settled into a rigid position. But um, if I may, to tell you a little bit about our Please. research in, in the... Um, well, in fact, it was the use of psilocybin um, as an aid to psychotherapy in treatment resistant depression depress depressive and um, what what we found was that um, treatment resistant depressives are a very sad group because they have a 15 percent suicide rate so people have to take them every day and they actually have very bad side symptoms and they don't work at all with everyone but um, psychiatry hasn't invented another approach. And, but we have done some research with psilocybin and we got um, a 67% success rate after the first two very small um, doses. And um, then it was, the people were still um, depression-free. Uh, I forget what it was. I think it was um, Forty-two percent of people were still depression-free three months later. So that's from. You well, know, let me. I, uh, I have to ask uh, you. I, for number one, you, uh, you you said that they're normally taking psychotropic medication, which has very bad side effects. 
So how often yeah. were they taking, how often were they microdosing to the point where you could get an accurate assessment where the depression was not, was latent or non-existent? Um, I had, I'm about to do a microdosing study. I haven't yet done it. Um, so what, so, so what was the percentage, the percentage, the percentages you were quoting just now were from what though? 67? Well, kind of, they were the equivalent in psilocybin. I see. Okay. Something like um, 70 mics or something, a middle dose. And, um, why, why a psychedelic is so, um, incredibly potentially beneficial is that they have the effect of shaking up um, rigid thought patterns and behavior, maladaptive Absolutely. Behavior, which get fixated. So the person makes the same mistake for the rest of their lives. And what happens in a, in a psychedelic state, particularly if someone has a, a good um, psychotherapist to guide them, is that their wish to overcome their problem, whatever it is, depression or addiction or whatever, becomes stronger. And under the psychedelic effect, the default mode network is um, reduced to the point of maybe the people have a complete ego dissolution. And that's rather like resetting a computer. Um, suddenly it all shakes up the whole setting and a new setting can can come into place, which hopefully is better suited for dealing with the, the situation in the real world. And that's what we've noticed. I've done research also in ayahuasca with um, yes. a collaborator yes, in, yes, um, yes. in Spain and um, LSD. We haven't yet done a study with um, LSD, I mean with psilocybin, uh, because it's been so taboo, LSD, it's very, very difficult to get approval. But um, I'm hoping that as we build up a body of evidence showing that there's very low harm and um, rather extraordinary results, um, um, because I think LSD will probably be more... Uh, um, more efficacious probably even than psilocybin and psilocybin is extremely successful I mean I, I worked with John Hopkins in a study um, uh, well I, it, I think it was my idea because I'd given up cigarette smoking in 1966 on one dose of LSD because I decided wow this is a horrible habit <laughs> and let's give it up I never smoked again Unbelievable. <laughs> so we did that at yeah. John Hopkins and there we had an 80% success rate. Uh, 80, 80, 80%. 80 percent. I, I just, yeah. psilocybin, are we talking about mushrooms? Is that mushrooms? Um, it would be, um, you know, uh, pharmaceutical um, psilocybin. Okay, so, so, so pharmaceutical made LSD. This was psilocybin. You know, magic mushrooms. Magic um, mushrooms, um, right? So magic. Be, so the mushrooms, yeah, but, the mushrooms. No, but they wouldn't. They they wouldn't. Um, you know how science likes everything to be. Um, um, uh, you know, um, the same every time. So they they wouldn't probably use natural products. It would be um, um, pharmaceutical um, psilocybin. Right. But which has the same effect. But it, 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 they wouldn't be going. They different. wouldn't be going out to the cow pastures no. to pick them out. In other words, no, right, no, and take. I mean, if they took them out from the cow patches, it would cost nothing or or three pounds if they bought them at some. Uh, right, you know, it has to go through through so many um, um, ho ho hoops and hurdles and restrictions. Um, it, it becomes extremely costly, but um, I think that will change in time. Let's hope. Well, I, you know, listen, we, we have a, a game on this program called Name That Voice. I'm not going to ask you to name the voice, but I do want you to listen to the content, and then we'll come back and yeah. talk about it, okay? Okay. Uh, where we, <coughs> you had um, cats like um, Timothy Leary and, and Ken Kesey, and you had these acid tests uh, up and down the east and west coast done in different variations. Uh, can you talk about the acid tests that were going on in England 
at the time. And uh, yeah, in England it was a very different scene. Very different scene. We didn't have acid tests as such. We uh, that was all very vulgar. That was an American uh, <laughs> vulgar view of it all. You know what yeah. I mean? Um, just brash and vulgar and open and wild. You know what I mean? England was a little bit more reserved than that. Um, England's had you know a, a history of eccentricity going back hundreds of years. So people taking acid was not necessarily. Uh, um, you know, that shocking or, or amazing an event. And in fact, in England, you'd be hard put to tell if anybody was taking <laughs> that, a drug of any kind because they didn't, you know, there wasn't any outward show of it. But for sure, LSD had a major effect in England. And um, it was, that was based on the universities because the universities, you know, were teaching people how to be chemists. And so all the university had laboratories, and all the laboratories were making acid all over, all over England. So um, um, the uh, uh, the net effect of it was that you could get on a train, for example, you know, a subway train in London, and you would see uh, see you know very regular straight English people going about their business, going to work, and all that, and you'd also see. Uh, rather kind of sparkly-eyed, uh, <laughs> uh, strange young people dressed in exotic kind of uh, romantic clothing who obviously were on some kind of drug, but one didn't know what, and uh, they'd be going home from, you know, uh, from uh, a party or whatever and had been up all night and was a completely other culture. There was a huge kind of paradigm shift in English popular culture, um, just like there was in the United States. The United States was, um, you know, the, based in San Francisco largely and, and in New York. Uh, the London thing, the England thing was based in London, but there was a very, a lot of rural stuff in England as well, in the countryside. People went, and, because uh, you couldn't live in towns, the towns had been bombed flat and they were expensive. A lot of, lot of uh, hippies or proto-hippies or beatniks, whatever you like to call them, moved from the towns out to Wales and Ireland and uh, rural areas, you know, and, and uh, did the same thing they did in America, look for a, a kind of alternative lifestyle. And uh, because it didn't really exist, people invented it for themselves, mm. along with, you know, as I say, along with uh, the, their own drugs and their own music and their own, their own version of, um, of how to be. All right, that was... Uh a guy named Sam Cutler, who uh, was the uh, tour ma road man tour manager uh, and manager for the Rolling Stones and also the Grateful Dead. Uh, right. And right. You, do you know him or no? Do you know who he, who he is? No. Yeah. So no, I, I, I but 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 I, I I I just want I I my whole dream is to be back with Amanda Fielding in '65. Uh, acts, ah, that was a wonderful time. Uh, well, I just, I mean, yeah. we're, we're, we're explain because what he was saying was the laboratories were 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 cranking out this pure LSD, but but he talked about this rural yeah. element, this rural element, and I wanted you to talk about your connections to the university, uh, how you got the LSD, and then ultimately when you know talk yeah. about talk about some of these experiences. Yeah. Well, actually. Um, I mean, I, I, I grew up in, um, in the country, a very beautiful place outside Oxford. But I, in the 60s, I was living in London, and, um, which was wonderful. Yep. And teacher on many levels, Bart Hooker, the Dutchman. And he had made it um, actually in his friend's uh, kitchen. And um, then he went to Ibiza in 65, and there it spread out across Europe. And um, at that point, some reached me in London. And um, it was a very, obviously, exciting experience of suddenly hitting this high point, which I'd known as a child as a mystical experience, and then later by studying it. But, um, but then, I have to say, I thought this is absolutely incredible. But you can't live on this experience. And then a year later, um, I met 
the, uh, the Dutch scientist who'd actually made the LSD, he came to London. And um, uh, we, we um, came together. And um, he had a hypothesis about how it works um, physiologically in the brain and how one can come to um, control one's consciousness on the higher level so that one could carry on all one's um, cognitive functions. And I found that amazingly exciting because you have the advantage of, um, of a, a, a very expanding consciousness and at the same time, the ability to keep in control of it and kind of not show that you were way, way out. And <laughs> I mean, that enabled me to read all of Freud, as I said, and the, all these uh, difficult books, which normally the words would dance off the page. Right. But by taking vitamin C to make adrenaline and aiming to keep the sugar level roughly normal, one then had enough energy to concentrate and carry out cognitive functioning at a higher level. And at that point, um, my passion was in a very, um, uh, whatever, um, you know, maybe naive way, was to save the world with this great new knowledge. And um, so we studied the, the human brain and, you know, why the humanity was such a terrible mess all day and then in the evening we played the Chinese game Go. I don't know if you know it. How but do you spell it? Um, How do you spell? G-O. Go. I don't it's know. No, I don't know. Games in the world. Oh, you must uh, look up Go. Oh. And it has more possible um, moves than the number of atoms in the universe squared and then squared again. I mean, you know, it, it's very much more complicated in the sense than chess, but very few rules. There's just one rule, which is politeness, that you have to warn your opponent before you take him. Um, but I found that if I was on LSD and kept my sugar level um, roughly normal, I, pl I won more games, basically. <laughs> I, I could see the board from yes. a higher yes. view. Yes, up, uh, up oh, this is unbelievable. And, and, and it was wonderful. You got that aha moment of just seeing and realizing that that move is the right move. And go is only a kind of, whatever, uh, a symbol for life. So uh, then I realized, well, uh, this amazing elixir not only um, makes one feel more healthy and more full of vitality and love and life and enjoyment, but it also improves one's cognitive functioning to a great degree. And so then I realized, really, with learning the knowledge of how to control oneself at this heightened state, I thought, well, this is incredibly valuable for humanity. And that was in six, 1966. Well, this and is, then this is I, want, I, want, I mean, I, I want you, this is so... Um, so I just want to be clear because again, our, our Skype thing—it's very frustrating. You 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 said you met uh, Bart Hugus, but then then. Sorry, would you say that again? Sorry, yeah, something went by. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you said originally you met this chemist Bart Hugus. Is that how you pronounce Bart it? Yeah. He wasn't. A, he was a natural scientist. He was a doctor, actually. But then and then and then the real catharsis, though, again occurred when you met Joe Mellon. Is that right? 30 years kind of thing and um, um, we're very passionate about um, what we thought could be so valuable to humanity well no that's what I want I want and so so here's the thing once you had this 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 transformation of this enlightenment who who was supportive who was supportive of your mission to get this into quote unquote the mainstream I, I would say absolutely no one. Uh, we were, <laughs> that is exactly, we were, I mean, that is exactly <laughs> unbelievable. So you were just uh, 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 just on the, on the, on the still ship. still no one. Still no one. Do you know, 50 years later, still no one. Right. I mean, I, I think the, uh, the definition of the ego 
as a conditioned reflex mechanism which controls the distribution of blood in the brain um, was a, you know, a, a genius breakthrough in thinking. But no one, no one wants to know about it, strangely. Although now our research at, um, which I set up at Beckley Imperial, Imperial College in London, um, has, uh, which looks at the default mode network and the other networks in the brain, has actually um, reinforced the, the, the reality of um, the fact that um, when you break down the repression in place by, um, you know, trauma and whatever is happening in one's life, um, underneath there's this mystical childlike experience, which is just there for everyone to touch and, and experience, but uh, habit stops us getting there kind of thing right well what you're, um, what you're describing is is habitual nature versus true nature and when you take psychedel yes. psychedelics you get that much closer to to your true nature Absolutely. yeah you get much closer i had a beloved pigeon who lived with me for yes. 15 years yes. and we were totally mated to and he much preferred people on lsd you know he felt you know now, now these people are, are true animals, right? Kind of, right. <laughs> um, kind of <laughs> puppets, wooden puppets. Um, but the, but the sixties was a very very exciting period in London um, because there was a feeling of change, and um, although no one particularly liked what we were talking about because it was too serious. Everyone was into more, you know, they were either adults and like their, their routine or they were the other end of the scale and they liked to kind of um, whatever, drop out. And uh, Whereas we were people who liked to take our compounds, expand our consciousness and then work with it. And that wasn't a very popular um, and, you know, of experience but now it's rather coming round. It, you, you, you feel you feel of, tell me I mean, Valley. explain exp I mean it's not coming from the political class so explain I mean Silicon Valley to be honest with you is I mean it's just the people with a lot I'm curious about where you see this coming around um, say that again. I didn't quite hear. Sorry. Sure, it's fine. Ex Wait. Explain. It's not coming from the political class. The momentum today. Uh, where is no. it? Where is it? No. Where do you see it germinating now? Um. Let me think. I think you said Silicon I mean, Valley. Thought, you said Silicon Valley. I think Silicon Valley is a, a, a mover and an example for people of where to go. Um, and I, I'm delighted that they've taken up the microdosing habit. I mean, I microdosed it, uh, what I did in the 60s became a microdose because I'd take um, LSD every day, and that in a way became a microdose um, because what I liked was hitting that sweet spot where um, vitality and insight is increased, but one still can more or less control one's behavior. Absolutely. Um, but but you have to get to the right. I mean, that's the that's the that's the. Amanda, I want you to talk about this because this is, I I uh, one of my advertisers on my show is a cardiologist here in Tucson, and he has me yeah. um, doing interviews about moderate red wine consumption with meals, and, and its correlation to heart health. Right. So, when you talk about microdosing. Some people, like my friends, I mean, I'm 40 years old, but when I would go to music concerts, I mean, I knew some of my friends. Um, they... Well, I consider microdose yeah. is, is hitting. I mean, I think everyone has different biological um, stamina and everything. Right. So for me, microdosing, I'm so sorry, it's a very noisy street. Um, it's fine. My, microdosing is uh, finding that that dose which gets you at a comfortable um, place where you're um, extra vitalized, extra fun, extra um, intellect, 
you know, you you feel you're at your best, basically. And um, now it's become kind of um, set, in a way, at something like 10 micrograms. But, you know, I think there are types of different ways of microdosing. You can microdose every day, but then, on the whole, you need to up your dose a bit. But as LSD is completely non-toxic, it doesn't have a toxic overload when you up your dose. Um, but, or you can do like my friend Jim Fadiman uh, suggests, um, which is very uh, sensible and um, um, controlled way, where you microdose maybe three days a week, you know, leaving a day or two in between. Um, and, you know, but I think there's no rules about it. It just means learning to live at a higher state by using um, using a compound which changes brain um, mechanisms in such a way that you have um, more light in your brain. Mm. And I always look on light is the oxidization of glucose. So if you get more blood in your capillaries, you feed more brain cells energy. And so they, you know, they spark and send their messages and you have a more comprehensive um, consciousness. And I just think, um, like Albert Hoffman said, oh, he loved... He didn't really like LSD very much because his first experience was rather traumatic. But he loved taking a little tiny dose to go for a walk in the woods. And um, because it made, you know, the woods come alive. and You could feel the spirit of God in them. Or no, I mean, it's... You're, I'm, but, but let me ask you. Let me, so in the 60s, in the late 60s, you were essentially micro, taking microdo You were microdosing every day. Um, and... You know, but in, in those days, our microdoses were quite big. You know, they how how big how, how big was a, how big was yeah. your micro? I, I want to know the Amanda Fielding microdose at that time. I mean, at that time, it was fairly fairly big. It could be whatever, 150 mics or more. Wow! Um, because by taking it every day, um, you the body gets used to that's it. what my so, question was my question was how do you so i want to go back to the cardiologist thing because the question is moderate red wine consumption with meals equals a healthy heart but the problem is what is moderate so the thing is you start yes. you start drinking you start I, ingesting microdosing but then all of a sudden your body gets used to it so you have to keep upping the dose right um yes but if you have a gap of three days yes two or three days right the body goes right back to the body. Oh, wow. And that's the wonderful thing about it. It, it, it doesn't stay around. It, it, it's cleaned out very quickly. And um, so I, I think a small microdose of uh, 10 micrograms um, can be, we used to call LSD a psychovitamin. I mean, it's, it's, it's better, better than coffee. Um, you know, much better for the body and better for the mind. And I think it could be of great value physiologically. And at the moment, uh, I'm, I'm starting a whole um, Beckley um, LSD research program. Um, and one of the projects I'm doing is studying LSD's effect on inflammation, um, neuroplasticity, um, and neurogenesis. And um, I think that would be very fascinating to see because I'm, it's actually good for the health. Um, but I think LSD um, is, because it's so clean, and then it exercises the heart and the, um, and the circulatory system. And you feel very active and, you know, sportsmen, love it because they feel they can um, play cricket better or run better or, you know, all of those sort of things. Amanda, and, no, um, this is so fast. I mean, did you did you wind up helping people who were having bad trips? I think a lot of people would say they always hear a story about, you know, 
or they know a friend who took too much yeah. and never made it out of their um, basement, their parents' basement again. I mean, did you, have you, I think that's I, one of the, yeah, it, yeah. Have, have you, have you? I mean, I've, I've had several very, very bad trips. I had one very bad trip. Can you talk about a bad trip you had? Um, yeah, it was in, when was it? 1965. Mm-hmm. When uh, 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 a guy who I never liked to look at would start hanging around, my flat in London became a kind of center people um, <laughs> who like that sort of thing, sure. including all sorts of musicians and people. And uh, this guy would hang around and I didn't like his look. And um, But then he put whatever, he had a bottle of LSD, which he got from Sandoz. And um, he poured it in my coffee, maybe 4,000 trips or something, when actually I'd had hepatitis and had refused the LSD. Um, and I had a, 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 you know, a really horrible death threat. Um, but um, so I know what a bad trip is, and I've had quite a few others. He he actually turned Leary onto LSD, and I, you know, I think they are to be avoided. A bad trip. Can I ask you a question? Did you did you have the, did you have the bad trip because unknowingly he he gave you five hits of acid in your coffee? No, not five, five, uh, three thousand or something. He poured it in into my coffee out of a vinegar bottle, a big vinegar oh, bottle. And so, and, was in the days when. You, and you already didn't so, trust the guy. Uh, you didn't trust him. Was yeah, he? Yeah, uh, I didn't trust right. him. And and then and then uh, um, and then you and then I just am curious because you talk about uh, playing go and uh, and and, yeah. ha- and having this sort of. Uh, multi-sensory sort of being able to see the board from above or, you know, going Albert Hoffman yeah. going yeah. into the woods and it becomes yeah. alive. Yeah. What's, the, what's the bad trip yeah. exper- dream, uh, experience like in terms of your mindset? Um, I would say it's a very bad experience. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, it, it's one, I, you know, a lot of people say when they have a bad trip and they're kind of what, they're having a horrible time. And you say, I'm so sorry you had that. And they say, oh, it was wonderful. I learned so much. But actually, mm. for me, I think a bad trip, a really bad trip, is a very unfortunate experience because it cuts, it facilitates um, a pathway of pain and, um, and fear in the brain. Um, so I, I don't think it has a benefit. And I'm very, very against people giving people trips without without telling them what's happening. Unknowing, unknowingly, what yes, works. unknowingly, yeah. Unknowing. Right, 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 right. And then we always had the safety measure after I met Bart. So then when that person did that to me, I retired, lived in a hut in the, in the country for about three months. And then a friend came and said, I must go to a party where Rubber Shanky was playing. And that's where I met Bart, the white, the white magician, the scientist, who taught me about how you keep control of your behavior when you're in a state of expanded consciousness. And I thought that, I have to say, was the most valuable lesson I ever learned. And really, um, I remember as a young child, I'd always dreamt of watering desert. And then I got to know, well, the desert is the human mind. That's, That's the desert in our reality. And so I saw um, trying to teach the world of the potential benefits of careful use of um, uh, compounds which can um, flood the brain with more light is immensely valuable, not only to the individual, but also to society at large. Uh, it's put to rest. And... Um, suddenly novelty and thinking outside the box becomes usual. And that's what's so wonderful about um, uh, altered state of consciousness. And I think society, modern society, has lost the knowledge of the value of, um, of that type of consciousness, which our ancestors had. Uh, ancestors knew, uh, you know, Stone Age, 40,000 years ago, uh, or, or whenever it was, um, you know, in the cave paintings of Chevaux or something, 
you can see that those people were were top high when they did those wonderful paintings, which have never been improved on. And they were in the pitch black caves underground. I mean, it's an amazing feat. And so uh, I think our whole culture is based on um, the, the expanded consciousness brought about by different ways of um, altering one's consciousness. Huh. You know, whether it's dancing or listening to drums or psychoactive substances, you know, or the toad venom or um, all those cultures, all wonderful top-level ancient cultures had at their center um, at the experience of um, enhanced consciousness. I mean, even the classical world, um, Eleusis was the center of the cultural happening. And um, that was drinking a kind of LSD-like substance and experiencing life and, uh, you know, life after death. So I think we've been very foolish by criminalizing these substances. Right. We, I mean, it's, it's it, it, well, I mean, we live in a very, a much more punitive time. I mean, I interviewed Merle Haggard, uh, uh, the great country singer, rest in peace. The guy was, um, he was in the hole in San Quentin and he had a hit record out. He was arrested 12 times yeah. in the seventies ah. in today's yeah. world. Uh, he'd be away for life. So you're criminalizing, yeah. uh, and that was more for yeah. alcohol and sort of, but when you talk about this, yeah. this, this cat who really helped you understand how to operate in, at a high functioning level with, on LSD, what kinds of, like, yes. I mean, are you talking about like a, a nine, were you working, a, could you talk about how some activities that would be considered um, mainstream or the type of jobs you that that while that you could that people can for, perform when on an appropriate dose of of uh cybercellular yeah. yeah well i i think you can perform whatever you set your concentration to at a at a slightly higher level because you've got more of your brain functioning right so you've got more um, impulses coming to enrich the experience and i mean um about that. Uh, they're, they're coming for uh, it. They're coming for you. Yeah. Yeah. They're coming. Yeah. I mean, the 60s, you always thought that they were coming for you. I know. But, yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Our, our mission was how do we understand better this kind of rather terrifying animal species that we come from? You know, why do we do such horrible things? What, what's wrong with us? Why are we repressed and um, cruel in the way we are? And how do we overcome it? And um, so that was our work and concentration went into uh, studying whatever, psychology and physiology, why people are the way they are, the history of the taking of substances, and how do we get it out there? How do we persuade um, the adult or the medical world that these compounds are amazing tools to heal human sickness, like depression or, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder, all, all of these psychological problems, which actually now have become a, an epidemic or are becoming one. I mean, no, it's full, um, full, blo the full blown. The only reason it's actually getting yeah. attention, the only reason it's getting attention in this country is because it's happening to white America. Yes, yes, absolutely. And I was, and, and they're still so taboo, taboo. I was going to do a research at a very leading, one of the leading top universities in America, in America and a lot of the rest of the world. And, um, you know, this was a very, very exciting study. And I found the funding, um, a very wonderful philanthropist was going to give the funding to carry it out. And uh, the scientist I was collaborating with was extremely keen on it. But then, you know, the voice from on high said, no, it's too taboo. We can't do that. Um, so it was squashed. So, but I, I'm, I'm, I will still do it somewhere else. But as it was such a kind of one of the leading universities in America, it would have been a very good place to have done the study. 
So we're always having to fight the taboo. And really, that's what I've been very conscious of for the last 50 years. Um, the, the taboo is the dragon. The, 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 the yeah. what, like, when you saw, when the, when the demagoguery came in, when they, when, you know, when they realized that, in fact, whatever they thought it was made for as a truth serum, uh, LSD, uh, that they could, you know, get, get you know, uh, you know, captured uh, enemy uh, people to tell the truth. Yeah. Um, like yeah. when, when you were fighting the political establishment in the late 60s, early 70s, would you do? I'm asking about what kinds of activities where you had to perform at a high cognition level. Did you do on yes. acid? Investigate how it works. And because I, I, I mean, I obviously lived through the formation of the war on drugs. Right. And one could see this, this is insanity. It's just going to make uh, everything immense suffering and, and harm it's going to cause. It was absolutely obvious. Um, people weren't going to give up the substances they loved. They were just going to go underground and become much more dangerous. It was obvious. Um, but then, you know, that occupied the next 50 years. And although theoretically one was allowed to do research with the psychoactive substances, in fact, the UN conventions blocked them. And so um, I realized that, well, one, one had to change global drug policy, and two, one had to carry out the best scientific research to demonstrate that these compounds have immense value. And, you know, as a, a female with no letters after my name <laughs> um, in a hostile environment, it, it was quite a problem to think how to do that. But, uh, you know, by putting one foot in front of the other for a very long time, slowly, uh, I think, you know, I and others managed to influence um, the situation. And I was one of the first people to set up um, and try to make world well, drug policy um, have a scientific evidence base as opposed to, uh, you know, being based on um, prejudice and, and, um, and political expediency. Um, and I really never really fought the government. So I tried to be their friend and do their work, which they should have been doing for them, if you see what I mean. Uh, and still, it was a long and very boring battle, that. And it still hasn't won. You know, it's still uh, appalling. Well, I mean, I want I want to be I want to tell you about how I actually um, even ever ever uh, you how, how I even found Amanda Fielding. Um, yeah. Back in February of 2015, I was doing uh, my first radio interview with uh, John Perry Barlow. And uh, hey, lovely, yeah. and he was um, talking to me about the April experiments, uh, you know, with uh, Ram Dass and uh, Richard Albert at the time and uh, Cybacillin yeah. and how they gave some sort of, you know, sort of uh, mixed uh, cocktail to one group. And then they gave the pure Cybacillin to the other group. And, the, and it was clear that everybody who took the purest Cybacillin had these transcendent experiences. So... After our interview, I called him and I said, you know, I really want to do a roundtable discussion, uh, a, a TED, TED Talk or a, uh, or a Facebook Live interview. Uh, Hello? Are you there? Yeah. Can you hear me? And funny enough, suddenly it went silent. And yeah, you know, it, 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 this is part of my, I'm sorry about this, but it, the, I, I, what I was, I, I, I asked him, I said, I want to do a roundtable discussion with people about the benefits of microdosing in our conformist society. And he yes. said, well, that sounds great. He goes, uh, I said, well, who do you think would be a good candidate to be on the panel? He said, Amanda Fielding. Yes. All right. Yeah. And, and yeah, yeah. so um, that's, yeah. uh, don't, I, I, I want to, I, I want, yeah. I want, I want to follow up on that later, but, but, um, yeah. But I, I do want you to talk about how you, how you connected originally with John Perry Barlow and, uh, and, 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 your, and uh, your relationship with him. Um, I think it was uh, Sean Lennon who introduced me to him. Um, Who's that? Who's an old friend. Sean Lennon. 
Sean Lennon, okay. Um, the, the son of John and Yoko. Wow. Who's a wonderful um, person. And he was very fond of John Perry Barlow, and he always said, um, he's the man you should meet in America. Um, <laughs> he was right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he was wonderful, John. And, you know, he was so funny, which isn't particularly um, a characteristic Americans often go in for, but he was kind of witty, wasn't he? Funny and unexpected. He was, well, he was uh, a stone cowboy. I mean, the, the guy was writing, yeah. the, the, I mean, they... they Wesleyan College bought stock in his yeah. high school newsletter. That's how he was a pretty, pretty brilliant yeah. cat. But no yeah. doubt a very yeah. edgy, funny cat. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, edgy, funny. And funny enough, amazingly well-educated. I remember my other son who studied classics at um, Oxford. And um, he, he quoted when John Perry was staying with us in the country. He suddenly said a line in... Latin, I said, you know, lifted my eyes and think as if, you know, English people learn Latin, but Americans on the whole don't. But of course, John Perry knew exactly what it meant. <laughs> and um, he's, he's, he was a wonderful, funny person. No, I love John. He was great. And, um, what kind of projects did you work on with him? Well, I would never say we worked on projects, if you know what I mean. Um, it was more... Uh, more a friendship, really, you know. Uh, he, 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 uh, he just was, he was a very nice expression of the American, um, um, you know, high life, if you like. I mean, so many, so much of America is so puritanical. And, and John was a breaker of taboos. Um, I, uh, no, he, 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 he was very, he was a mason, all sorts of funny things. He stood to be, um, a, re, uh, a, a, what is it? I can't remember what, but some government seat he nearly, nearly got and didn't. And he, and he, he saw the internet very clearly at a very early stage. And, but he was just a lot of fun, basically. Yeah. But he treated his body very badly. And, um, I'm afraid. Did, uh, I mean, you know, because what was really interesting is I talked to a good friend of his before he passed on, and um, yeah. the guy said um, that John called him about four months before he passed and said, yeah. "Hey, uh, hey, Bob, come over. We're we're tripping out tonight." He was still yeah. eating psychedelics when he was dying. Yes, yes, <laughs> I'd expect him to absolutely. I I went and visited him for that long, rather painful period. Yeah. But, and, you know, he just loved life so much. He loved Burning Man. He loved being in the country. He loved, you know, he, he was, he, he was a sunster, wasn't he? Um, but, um, and I think he's left a, a good legacy behind. But, uh, you know, he, he, he was a very different type of animal to, how how I broached the problem, do you know what I mean? I suppose I was more serious, and and um, I I've I've kind of dedicated my life to how do you get my life to thinking how do we use these incredibly non toxic pure compounds to um, help humanity who obviously has something at core slightly faulted in their, our makeup how, how, how can we make use of these compounds to help us overcome our illnesses like psychological illnesses and also physiological illnesses and then also um, give us inspiration and creativity and spiritual um, insight and I do think that they can do all these things. And so I've really spent the last 50 years of my life in the work sense, thinking and um, doing everything within my capabilities um, to make this happen. And I think, like I was rather a good Go player, I'm quite a good strategic thinker. <laughs> so 
you know, I, I, I think I, but I'm quite exhausted. I've played this game now for 50 years. I mean, you must, I mean, and you're still cranking on, I mean, you, for you to, to put up with me for an hour and 20 minutes, it, I mean, you're cranking right now. Oh, well, it, it, it's a great pleasure to talk to someone who's interested in it. And I do think headway is being made, and I think we've turned the first tipping point. I mean, where um, people used to say to me, Oh man! Oh, well, they say, say now. Oh man! We always thought you were totally mad, mm -hmm. um, but now we can see uh, you were probably right all along, kind of thing. I think there's been a tipping point in kind of understanding of of um, altered states of consciousness. Well, we're just living. I mean, we're living through a, a a time where it could be considered to be. Um, I mean, we're on the on the precipice of of of. I mean, whether we yeah. really ever lived in a democracy is questionable, but I mean, we're on the precipice exactly. of falling directly into an autocratic kind of situation. So, I mean, once Absolutely. you reach a crisis point, that's when people say, oh, wow, Amanda wasn't yeah. so off a rocker yeah. to begin with. Yeah, and, and, and that is most creative thinking happens in, in disaster zones. So, um, and we're certainly kind of heading for a disaster zone. So, do you know... And I do actually seriously think that these compounds are of immense usefulness because I think that, um, uh, well, that there's a very, uh, you know, that the humanity is maybe short of blood in its brain because of its upright position. Right. And overcame this shortage by developing a very highly controlling um, compensatory me mechanism which is the ego, which controls where the diminished amount of blood goes in the brain. What is allowed to become consciousness, what is kept repressed. And in the human brain, an awful lot of experience is kept repressed. And that's not a very healthy situation. So it's good to kind of wash out um, the arteries of the brain and the capillaries, you know, wash the, it out. And I think that's what... Um, a careful use of a psychedelic can do. And it's also like good irrigation. Um, you know, it's like farming. You want to irrigate your land. Well, you and also, but you also need I to, you also need to till the soil and, and you know, and, yeah. and, and uproot exactly. it. As you said before, hit the reset button, but I mean, stir that soil yes. so that you get new compost, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's exactly what one do, uh, needs to do. So I don't think that taking uh, a psychedelic like LSD on its own creates the mystical experience, but if you um, if you um, farm the soil so it's rich in the possibility of a mystical experience, uh, the changes that a psychedelic can bring about um, produces fertile ground to have a mystical experience. I mean, a microdose is a wonderful. Um, a partner to meditation. Um, I mean, actually, both meditation and and microdosing diminish the uh, control of the default mode network or the ego, and so they complement. Come depression, it can improve mood. It can, I'm sure, help a lot of those um, borderline states. Um, quite possibly, you know. Um, old age, dementia, and those sort of things. Well, that's, I mean, that, 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 I mean, uh, where's the most progressive place in the, in the world that's even uh, spending any time uh, uh, putting resources towards this, the research? Uh, um, I don't know if there is. I mean, I'm, my problem is the resources. I've got um, collaborations I'm doing around the world, actually. You know, I'm doing, um, I've just set up a wonderful collaboration doing LSD research in Brazil. Um, you know, we're looking at how LSD um, can um, improve um, um, inflammation, decrease inflammation or increase neurogenesis or increase neuroplasticity. Wow. That, that's a very special quality is that it can make the brain much more plastic. It makes it like hot metal. So, um, 
you can bend it and, and change out of your rigid setting and overcome, you know, uh, the rigidity of a m misplaced concept. Um, and, and then it can enhance a sense of fun, which after all is quite important, and happiness and love. And it can actually, I think, definitely stimulate cognitive functioning. Um, because it widens uh, uh, the reach, the breadth, and the depth of um, what enters consciousness. So it, they're, they're, they're amazing tools, and it's typical of human madness that we've gone and criminalized them, and that now the prison industry is being filled by um, poor people. Um, you know, well, I mean, they, they, we still can't. We still can't. Yeah, we I mean, we're still criminalizing uh, marijuana, but but I mean, you know, I, but yeah. you know, uh, so basically, uh, in homage of John Perry Barlow, my my question is, when it, when are you coming back to the United States? Um. Uh, well, what what year? Is I mean, I'll I'll come some point this year. I I don't know when. I, I um, guess what I was going to say is that uh, yeah. that um, I would love to. I, I realize resources are tight, but I I would love to come and do some in person video interviews with you and other people that yeah. are doing this most important work um, because yeah. we're friends on Facebook, and I will transcribe a lot of these stories right. but the next step in our evolution in homage to john yeah. perry barlow is for me to come to you and we can really have prolific video interviews yeah. that, that will yeah. uh that will blow, go out all over the world this is the best way to get to people as well is through new media yes no i i i completely agree and i would be delighted to do it i mean for the last 20 years I buried myself in this kind of great um, burden of the Beckley Foundation, which I started as an artwork, and now it takes up 15 hours every day of my life, kind of thing, running it. Um, but I, I long to break through, through and have a, you know, I think communicating and is, is incredibly valuable to change society and people how people look at things. Well, I, I, I mean, like please, I, I have, I come and stay sometimes. Yeah. Well, I, so can I call you, uh, yeah. later and we can talk more about it. Cause I, 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 I have yeah. tried to find, I've tried to connect with you for, uh, two years. You know, I am very passionate and, uh, Oh, well, I should apologize. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Well, I wonder. Yeah. Lovely. Well, I, thank I'll call you tomorrow. Thank okay. You. Much love to you. Super. Right. Okay. Yep. Love to you too. Yep. Bye. Bye. Well, it's been a long time coming, two years in the making, talking to Amanda Fielding, the head of the Beckley Foundation, looking for positive change uh, with microdosing uh, and using cybacillin to uh, help with post-traumatic stress disorder um, and uh, depression and uh, a lot of things that we're hung up on right now in a very, very conformist time. We'll be back later on this week with the Jake Feinberg Show. Take it easy.